Thank you, Diana, for, for taking this time for us to talk about The Kid Reporter. I, uh, I heard it was your favorite short film, is that right? It really was, yes, it is. It, it's in good shape, and it had, it had more of a plot to it than most of them. Uh, how old were you when you made that? I was uh, not quite three. Now, your your uh, co-star, Buddy Williams, and you work really well together. Uh, did you make any other films with Buddy? I think I made uh, Hansel and Gretel with him. I think he played uh, Hansel. Now, the uh, newspaper editor, James Kelly, uh, he came across as a very warm individual on the screen. Uh, yes, I remember him uh, fairly well. Now, at three years old, uh, did you get to chew gum off screen or just on screen? On screen only. <laughs> I didn't. I, I, I endorsed uh, gums, and I also endorsed uh, crush, uh, orange crush and drinks like that, but I wasn't allowed to drink them. Uh, here's one of those, those questions that uh, has been bothering me. Uh, I would like to know about the little mustache that, that that you put on with glue, but how did they keep the monocle on your face? Well, the monocle, the monocle, I had to learn how to get it in between the bone in the around surrounding the uh, the optical uh, area where the where the eye rests, and that that workout. Uh, um, the the uh, other actor and myself spent quite a few hours every day on on just learning t t teaching me how to do that because it was quite a trick and I had to be held upside down shaken a couple of times to, and I still had to keep it in but I learned he he taught me how to get it in between the upper upper part of the bone and the lower part and. Um, we we worked together on it, and um, then at the end of the day, he he attached it and put with spirit gum, and uh, then at the end of the day, when we were finishing for the for the final scene, he ripped it off, ripped off the, the mustache. It was a very unpleasant little session that part of it. Buddy Williams have to carry you on his back as part of the audition, or was that just uh, a, a, a given? That was, a, that was the film, yeah. That was part of the, of the, of the film story. Because I sat down on a on a hot hot seat in some I've forgotten what it was. One 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 part of it. Yeah, did he practice carrying you around, or was that just a t one take? It was just the one take. Uh, he he was carrying me. Um, I was I was working with the with the uh, woman policeman um, Blanche Payson. Mm -hmm. She was very. We worked together constantly. I worked with all of these people every day, and so we had a very good rapport between us. And I I I liked I. There was a certain rhythm about working with these other people. They they knew what I could do, and I knew what they could do. Yeah, that uh, uh, that Blanche Payson. Uh, uh, do you know any more about her, or, or uh, did she you? She was a former. She was a former uh, policewoman in uh, in L.A. And she she worked. Uh, she was especially uh, honored during the uh, the festival, whatever, whatever festival, the Orange Orange Festival in, in 1915. Mm-hmm. Anyway. She was she was honored, and what she got she got a job working at Century first as a as a duenna or a, or a bodyguard you might say for all the the, the young women that played um, bathing beauties in in Century films and uh, Christie films too I think. She gave up on that job because she couldn't keep them from going out. Everyone came in and said, well, the, the, uh, the director said it was okay to, to take them out and on a date. And uh, she said, no, you don't, not past me, you don't take them out. <laughs> and so she got tired of saying no to everybody. And then so when 
she told the studio she was not going to do that anymore. They decided to hire her. She was a very good actress. They, they said I decided to hire her in my films, and so I played it almost in every one of my films. She was in many, many of them. How did you drive the car? Or were you sitting on somebody's lap, or did they just push it from the other side, the opposite the camera angle? In in what scene was that? In, in you, Kid Reporter? Yeah, you jumped in in the car, and it it looked like you were driving it. I think they had a, a telephone book or something underneath it. <laughs> I, I usually got um, something to get me up when I had a little more purchase and a little more a higher vision out through the, through the windshield. Uh, it, it, was that the same way with driving the boat? Yes. <laughs> it was very similar, yes. Well, that boat if was... Got a more, it gave me a little more purchase. Well, the boat was going pretty fast. Yes. Well, I I think you were sort of a daredevil there anyway. <laughs> well, I got to be. I got accustomed to being a daredevil, yes. I realize that most of the interior shots were uh, of the newspaper office uh, were done at Century, but uh, where were the other scenes shot? All the outdoor scenes were, were shot on the front lawn uh, in front of the facade of the... Uh, Frank Borzaghi, a producer, his mansion over on on the uh, um, uh, main street, at the Brea, just at, at the outer northern point of of the uh, of the Hollywood. It was a beautiful home, and all of the front scenes with with Peggy going to the front door and getting picked up by the butler and thrown away and everything. All of those scenes were done there on that front step. And it was because the, the producer was very favorable to the studio. I don't know whether he was tied in with them some way or other, but I, I have no idea. But I know that we used that facade a lot. And it was only just for that, not just for that picture, but we used it on several occasions. And uh, the other background that you'll see is when I'm being pursued with the uh, policewoman. There, that was the, the Beverly Hills Park, and it was a beautiful scene. That park in those days was perfectly gorgeous. You know, it was just absolutely pristine, and nobody was ever messing it up, you know. So, um, but that's where that was. That was right there in Beverly Hills. I, I looked on, on several sources, and I couldn't find the name of the woman who... Uh, reported the missing jewelry. Do you remember who that was? Oh, the 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 that was the wife of um, that was the the wife of um, oh. I can't think of his name. He was a producer. Oh, the producer. Okay. Yeah, he was a producer, and um, at Century, and very well known director too. She married him. She used to work with 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 Jackie Coogan's mother back in the before before Jackie was uh, famous. So she wasn't an actress. Um, well, she was a kind of an actress. Yes, she had been at the stage with with uh, um, with Jackie Coogan's mother, Lillian. They had, they had done act together early. I, I did some research on my biography of Jackie, and I found that out. But um, she was uh, what was his uh, famous, very famous director. And uh, I have to rack my brain a minute to get it. <laughs> if it comes to me in the course of this query. I'll try to get. Oh, it. So, okay. All right. Well, the, the last question is probably the last scene. Uh, what about the milk? Well, that is considered what I was told that they used to call that a commercial. Because I know it is product placement, but that was way before its time. Yeah, and the, 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 the milk was a way to advertise the milk and promote it with the children who were watching the film. Aha. Uh -huh. And it was pretty stark and pretty basic about 
propaganda, you know. And uh, so I was, I was looking, I was drinking the milk, and I was selling it at the same time, practically. Yes. And did you drink your milk off screen? Oh, I always did. Yes. Well, that's good. That's good. A anything else? I you never... go ahead. I constantly ran into children when I was on the stage, when I was in, uh, on personal appearances. Uh, I constantly, in my life, over the years, as I grew older, I kept meeting people who didn't like me, who said they had learned to hate me because their mothers always said, you should do what baby Peggy does. You should eat your, eat your spinach and drink your milk. <laughs> and they, they hated me because I was the cause of their spinach. spinach. Uh. Do you like? And I, met, I, I kept meeting people who had been children at the same time as I was a child, mm -hmm. and they kept telling me that I, I used to hate you because you were always the one that my my parents always said, well, they, you, I should be able to drink my milk and eat my spinach just like you do. Do you like spinach? I did. That was one of my favorite vegetables. Yes. It was. Cream spinach. Cream spinach was my favorite vegetable. Wow. Hmm. The kid didn't know it, but I really liked it. <laughs> <laughs> is is there anything I've left out that you wanted to, to say about the film? About uh, the kid reporter? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it had more character than any any other film that I had made it, that I I can recall, because I I had that director with me. Alf Goulding was a very, very careful director, and he rehearsed me, which other directors didn't do. He rehearsed me in the morning before the shoot, and he would teach me how to do what I'm going to do that day, which is something other directors didn't do. And I felt more confident with him because it wasn't just the the getting the, the monocle in the eye. That was one one of the rehearsals, but... But the other rehearsals were things that were other directors would have would should have done but never did, and um, so. But I was that that director, um, Alf Goulding, had been a child actor himself in Australia, and he had traveled all over the Middle East and all of the most impossible places like Burma, and uh, all over the place or dangerous situations and um, so he had a lot of experience he worked with 50 other children they started they, they went to work at six years of age and they were they worked in his company until they were 16 and at 16 they were supposed to retire well that that particular my director did not retire at 16 he stayed on and he knew all the parts, and so he he asked to stay on and become the director of the children in the film in the in, in the company. Um, there was a stage company. They used to do imitations of of uh, Gilbert and Sullivan and all kinds of very difficult things to do. There were reviews of them in San Francisco when they played in San Francisco, and they were considered remarkably. And so he had years of experience teaching children how to act on stage. Because when he when he retired, he didn't retire. He he was 18 years old by the time he was still working, and he was he was directing children on stage every day who had, who had to know how to do everything that he had done himself. So he knew all the parts, and uh, he imparted all of the details to these children who were six to 16. And I didn't know at the time, but now I do. And in looking looking up the research, uh, he was an extraordinary person for me to have had as a director at that time, because I was the perfect child for him, and he was the perfect director for me. <clears throat> well, it sure sounds like you got a lot from him in, in your uh, this film and and others that followed. Yes, I did. I learned a lot from him. And and uh, he he took the time he took the time to to uh, <clears throat> inform me about a lot of things that other people assumed I, I didn't you know assumed I didn't have any curious curiosity about. <clears throat> I had a lot of questions. 
but I didn't often ask them because I was very um, quiet as a child. I didn't give anybody a bad time. You know, I didn't talk when I didn't wasn't needed to. And I suppose he wrote uh, Kid Reporter for you. Is that correct? So anyway, uh, this film was had more story than most, and Al Gould claimed he wrote it, and it had several little uh, subliminal stories. One of which was she she reflected, I reflected, the secretarial stress, struggles of, of females working in a male office because women did not work in offices before the Second World, before the First World War. And after the First World War, they entered the, they entered the workforce. And she is an example of a, of a female working as a secretary instead of a man, who obviously this editor of, of this newspaper was used to having a male for everything. And everything else, they were all men in that office except for me. And... She was having the struggles of the first women being on a job, and it was a, you'll see that she's she's doing gum, which was a no-no among men, apparently. But even if they did it, it would be okay. But for a woman to be chewing gum on the job was somehow very, very reprehensible. And... Uh, that was part of the fact. And she was also supposed to be lazier because they didn't have a work ethic, supposedly. And so she's shown sleeping in the safe early in the scene. And in several cases, she she is very... Uh, she's, she's efficient in her own way, but she's different because she's not a man. And the implication is that women had a rough go of it trying to get into the workplace, which is true. And that was that was her story, and that was a story at another level. But the off-camera level was, was me learning how to do all these things, because there were very tricky things I had to learn to do there. I had to learn to use the cane, and I and to point it, and to to uh, in one case I had to pretend that I was a 90-year-old man, my own grandfather, and. Uh, so there were a lot of little businesses that I had to be taught to do that normally I wouldn't have had to do, especially the monocle, which was a very special trick. Well, that sounds really, really interesting. And I thank you so much for the look behind the scenes of your favorite uh, short, The Kid Reporter. Thank you, Diana. Thank you very much for asking. Okay. Okay. Bye.